I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, fine. How are you getting along in school? Oh, just wonderfully. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Let me test you. Use the word Mississippi in a sentence. Mississippi. That's the river. Yes. Well, the, the river's name is Mississippi. Oh, I think you can do better than that. Can you? Sure. Show me. All right. My brother eats peas with a knife, and he never Mississippi. Oh, Oh, that's so easy. Oh, it's true, he does. Oh, oh, read me the funnies, will you please? Fuck the comic weekly. Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of page one... Oh, goody. Hop along, Cassidy. That's right. Hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for a hop along. Hop along, Cassidy had captured the leader of the outlaw gang, a girl named Calico. As he was taking her to hand her into the law... Her henchman trailed Hoppy, and in trying to get away from them, Hoppy rode Topper out onto an old wooden bridge, which collapsed. Hoppy fell into the river below, blacking out completely. Suddenly, suddenly there's a rush of water on the back of his neck, and Hoppy wakes up and hears a voice saying, On your feet, Cassidy. Hoppy looks around and finds that instead of the river, he's in a shack surrounded by boxes of dynamite. A rough-looking man with a gun in his belt is standing in front of him. As Hoppy wonders how he got there, the man tells him, You were fished out of Soda Creek when the old log bridge gave way. Miss Calico ordered you brought here. Hoppy gets to his feet. And first picture next row, the man leads him outside. Hoppy exclaims, The pyrite diggings. The man replies, Right, get busy and help unload that ore car. Hoppy's put to work pushing a car loaded with ore that's brought up from the mine underground. The man working beside him says softly, Now you're lucky they didn't put you in the mine tunnel, crew stranger. It's the dust and sulfur fumes that kills them off quick down there. Suddenly a guard steps up and knocks the man down with the butt of his gun, saying, If you can't remember to quit talking, here's something that'll teach you. At the sight of this cruelty, Hoppy turns quickly, last picture top row, and knocks the guard down, saying... And here's your lesson for today. Hoppy raises his hand to give the man another punch when suddenly, first picture bottom row, his wrist is caught on the end of a bullwhip, a long whip 20 feet long. At the other end of it, Hoppy sees a tough-looking character who snarls. We allow only one mistake like that, Cassidy. You've used up your quota. Hoppy looks at his wrist, around which the tip of the bullwhip is still wound, then looks at the man holding the handle and exclaims, Not yet, bullwhip, and gives a quick jerk on the whip, pulling the man over. And the whip is in Hoppy's hand. The man with the bullwhip roars last picture. Put him on the tunnel gang and keep him there till he drops in his tracks. And in a second, two guards with rifles are coming at Hoppy. Oh, now Hoppy's in trouble again. But wasn't it brave of him to punch that guard for hitting that other man so cruelly? It certainly was. Maya, I wonder what's going to happen to Hoppy now. Well, those two men with rifles aimed at him make things look pretty grim. We'll find out more next week. Now what? Oh, now, let's turn over the page and just see what's there. All right, over the page we go. And there... Oh, oh there's Prince Valiant on page three. And my goodness, what a terrible thing's been happening. Black Robert has been attacking the castle where Prince Valiant is. Yes, Castle of Sir Ree Fook. And Prince Valiant has captured Black Robert's son. And then, when Black Robert broke down the castle wall, Sir Ree Fook had tied Black Robert's son to a stake where the wall was and knocked down. Yes. He hoped that then Black Robert wouldn't attack the castle for fear of killing his son. But Black Robert... 
robber did attack anyway. And then Fairy Hook's beautiful daughter, well, all of a sudden, she came running in the middle of the battle and tied herself with a chain to Black Robert's son, who was tied to the post. Isn't that romantic? Yes, it certainly is. Well, now let's see what happens to the two young lovers who have defied their fathers. And here we go with Prince Valiant and the days of King Arthur. Hecate, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for Fair, Fair Prince. <laughs> First picture, the soldiers all stop fighting as they see the beautiful young girl with her arms around the young man tied to the stake. On one side stands Sir Refook, father of the girl. And on the other stands Black Robert, father of the boy. Prince Valiant steps back from the breach. And Black Robert looks beyond his son into the face of the man he hates. Refook glares past his little daughter at his proud enemy. The horrid din of battle dies away as the two leaders falter. Will they continue to fight? Then Val's clear voice rings out. Well, shall we continue the fight and sacrifice these two youngsters to your hate and pride? He goes on first picture, bottom row. Well, you two gamecocks can't finish this by single combat, for your families would only continue to feud for generations to come. Then Val unties the girl and the boy from the post, saying, May I suggest that we leave the matter in the hands of these young people to settle? And of course, the two young lovers decide that instead of continuing the battle, they should have peace so that they can be married and join the kingdoms of Black Robert and Sir Refook. And so, in the future, many a verse was written and many a song was sung to the young woman who chained herself to the stake with her lover. Oh, I'm glad that Prince Ryan made those two fathers stop that silly old fight. So am I. What is that in the last picture? Oh. Well, that's the wife and the little child of one of the soldiers who was killed in the battle. Oh, my, it's too bad that Prince Val couldn't have stopped the battle before so many of the soldiers were killed, though. Yes, it certainly is, but too often the wise men aren't listened to. An unhappiness to some people, awful results. And now let's read something more cheerfully. Let's skip over the page. And there's Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Oh, goody, goody, goody. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, hoppity, make, make it, it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Br'er Porcupine ain't got sense enough to know that Br'er Fox ain't a critter of his word. Well, Br'er Porcupine is coming down the road. He tells Br'er Fox that Br'er Rabbit needs a doctor. Br'er Fox says, Well, now, you was a busy man, Br'er Porcupine, so get on back to work. I'll go get Doc Crane for Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> so Br'er Porcupine goes about his business. Br'er Fox scoots for home. He puts on a costume to make himself look like old Doc Crane. A little later, Br'er Fox, with a long black coat, tall hat, long hair, glasses, and a beak, Looking something like Doc Crane, he's at Br'er Rabbit's house. As he mixes the medicine, Br'er Rabbit sees Br'er Fox's tail sticking out underneath the coat. And right away, Br'er Rabbit knows that this is Br'er Fox and not Doc Crane. And Br'er Fox says, Br'er Rabbit, you has got the uh, Ricky Mortis itch. Uh, just uh, drink a little of this stuff and your troubles will be over. <laughs> and Br'er Rabbit replies, uh, okay, Doc. But remember, you always drink your own medicine with me. First picture, bottom row, Br'er Fox says, Oh, yes, yeah, Br'er Rabbit. I always drink the same medicine with my patients. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, like a toast. Br'er Rabbit replies, Hey, Doc, um, would you mind getting a little sugar for mine? So Br'er Fox goes out of the room to get the sugar. 
Brer Rabbit switches the glasses of medicine. Brer Fox comes back again. And picks up the glass of medicine which he has mixed for Brer Rabbit. Medicine which he had intended to kill Brer Rabbit with so he can eat him. And as Brer Fox drinks the medicine, he suddenly yells, No! And just then, in the door comes Brer Porcupine, and Brer Rabbit tells him, Hey, you better run and get Doc Crane for Brer Fox. I is all well. And Uncle Remus says, Yep, sometimes you can get well just by thinking of folks who is worse off than you is. Yes, when Brer Fox mixed up some poison that would kill Brer Rabbit, Brer Rabbit just found an excuse to send him out of the room and then switched the glasses of medicine, and Brer Fox got a taste of his own medicine. <laughs> yes, he did. Well, now, shall we see what Dagwood and Blondie are up to? Oh, yes, please. And here they are on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Leaky. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood and Blondie go to bed early because they're both very tired. But no sooner are they in bed than they hear shots. Dagwood sits up in bed and exclaims, Hey, what's that? There's some excitement going on up the street. Last picture, top row, he jumps into his pants saying, Sounds close, Blondie says. Well, you were the one who said you wanted to get a good night's sleep. But Dagwood pays no attention to her, just dashes down the stairs, puts on his coat, dashes out the door, saying, Oh boy, I hope I don't miss anything. As he runs out on the sidewalk, suddenly a burglar comes dashing down the street right at him, followed by 16 cops shooting their guns and yelling, Oh! Oh! Last picture of the row, they run directly at Dagwood, who exclaims, Oh my goodness! The first picture next row, Dagwood starts running down the street so he won't be shot. He finds that he's running along beside the burglar. On and on they run. And they end up in a lumberyard. As they hide in one corner, the burglar says, Hey, we're cornered. Now what do we do? Dagwood angrily exclaims, And hey, where do you get that wee stuff? And he yells so loud, the cops hear him and surround them. And a second later, they're caught. Last picture of the row, the cops have brought the burglar and Dagwood down to the police station. And Dagwood is asking the captain, May I phone my wife, please, Captain? First picture, bottom row. Blondie has answered the phone, and Dagwood is saying to her, Don't ask any questions, Blondie. Just come down and get me out of here. And Blondie replies, And you were the one who wanted to get to bed early. An hour later, Dagwood and Blondie come up the stairs. Blondie is leading Dagwood by the ear. Dagwood looks very sheepish. Alexander asks, Hey, what happened to Pop? And Blondie replies, He was out playing cops and robbers at midnight. And last picture, Dagwood and Blondie are in bed again, sound asleep. And Dagwood is lying there, snoring, with one foot tied securely to the bedpost. <laughs> Yes. Blondie tied Dagwood to the bedpost so that he won't run out of the house again and keep her awake all night. Yeah, she's not so dumb. <laughs> no, she's not. That was so funny, Dagwood getting caught with that robber. <laughs> yeah, that's one time curiosity got Dagwood into a pickle. Uh -huh. Oh, look, right underneath Dagwood, here's Roy Rogers. I'll read that in just a moment, but first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page one of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Hi yip hi -yo. Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi -yo. <laughs> Knuckles Hardy is waiting in the old Indian fort to ambush Roy, who has trailed him there. When Knuckles sees that his son Tommy is with Roy, he slips away, leaving Nitro Kane and Furhead Fenton to deal with Roy. As Roy and Tommy stealthily approach the old blockhouse, Tommy says, 
Do you reckon the fur-headed galoot who chased me's in that blockhouse, Roy? Roy replies, I don't know, Tommy, but his tracks led straight to the fort. From the window inside the blockhouse, Furhead Fenton is watching Roy approach, and he whispers, All right, get ready, Nitro. Here they come. Nitro waits behind the open door with a club in his hand, and as Roy enters, Nitro knocks him out. When Tommy sees Roy knocked out, he runs for his horse, and he's chased by Furhead Fenton. Tommy leaps in the saddle, and last picture, Top Row gallops away. Come on, get going, Clover! First picture, bottom row, Furhead Fenton, who had tried to catch the boy, goes back into the blockhouse. He tells Nitro that Tommy got away. Quickly, Nitro ties Roy to a chair. Then, Furhead nails a board across the window, saying, yeah, Better make sure Hardy's kid don't come back and cut him loose. This board will keep him out. Then Nitro and Furhead slip away to join Knuckles Hardy in blowing up the riverbank so the water can flow on a Hardy's ranch. A little later, third picture bottom row, Roy comes to. He hears a noise, and he sees Tommy squeezing through the window. Tommy says, I waited till I saw him ride off, Roy. Oh, this is a tight squeeze. Roy replies, Careful, Tommy. I heard him say they're going to blow the riverbank to divert the water and leave, and leave the small ranchers high and dry. A moment later, Roy is untied. They run out to their horses. Last picture, they gallop off. Tommy shouts, Hey, how are you going to stop him, Roy? Roy replies, I don't know, Tommy, but if the river busts its seams, all the water in the valley will be controlled by one man, and I can't let that happen. Maybe Roy will get there in time to get even with them for hitting him on the head. Yes, Roy's back in action again. And next week, we'll find out what he does. But well, now, let's see what Flash Gordon is up to. So let's turn over the page, go past Jungle Jim, and there on page three is Flash Gordon. Oh, this is exciting, too. When Flash and Dale and Queen Suni hid in the dragon's cave, they found a secret underground room. Yes, Prince Fino, a friend of Queen Suni who had escaped from the wizards, is secretly manufacturing metals in the caves. And this is against the wizards' law. And Goro, who knows that they're underground, came back with the wizards and the wizards' soldiers to try to capture them. So quick, let's read. Very well. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga, riga, doon, doon, saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash is trapped underground by the wizard's army. With sheer courage and a few quick-firing dart throwers, Flash routes Goro and the advance guard invading the cave world. Flash fights his way to the surface. But suddenly, his metal weapons melt as the wizard's rays hit them. Flash orders grimly, Fall back, men! We'll make a stand in the tunnel. Don't let them pass! Last picture, top row. Dale and Queen Sunni help Flash's men put together crude firebombs. Flash directs, load the catapult. When these metal containers are melted by the wizard's rays, the chemicals will mix and explode. First picture, bottom row. Everything happens as Flash expects it to. When the wizards invade the underground tunnel... And when their rays hit, the flame bombs explode. They drive the besiegers back out of range. But the wizards rally them, and Perzo commands, Keep the rebels surrounded! Watch your wizards punish those who defy us! Last picture... Erzo uses mammoths, animals like elephants, to haul huge plastic reflectors to focus the metal melting rays against the caves. Erzo says in a voice of doom, The rebels dared to dig forbidden metal ore in the underground mines. Watch now, and you shall see the earth melt and turn their fort into a tomb. <laughs> Wizards have brought up to the front of the cave 
something to make the rays go into the cave and melt everything inside? Yes, even the earth is supposed to be melted by the rays from that big machine. My, how will Flash ever escape from this? Well, let's hope he thinks of some way to outsmart those wizards. Oh, my, I hope so. Well, now I can read Dick's adventures for you if you'll go over to the last page. Oh, I certainly will because Dick is in the early days of America and the British soldiers are chasing George Washington's army and trying to capture it. Yes, and Dick had volunteered to blow up a bridge with some other men. And one of the men started to slip away. And Dick chased after him because he thought the man was a traitor. And then all of a sudden the man hit him on the head and knocked him out. Yes, well now let's see what happens in Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggity pack, a zack, a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. First picture, Dick, lying in the bushes, slowly comes to. His head hurts, and he exclaims, Wow, somebody just hit me a terrific wallop. Where am I? A moment later, Dick remembers. He's with General Washington's army, moving across New Jersey with the King's Redcoats right on their heels. He exclaims, Hey, that militiaman James is a spy. He stalked me and ran. Then Dick looks up as he hears a hurried rush of feet. He sees himself surrounded by soldiers. Quickly, they jerk Dick to his feet and march him off. First picture, next row. As Dick goes with them, he realizes they're British, for they carry the Union Jack. But there's a foreign look about them. And they're gabbling in a strange language. Dick says to himself, German. Then Dick begins to talk to them. The soldiers stop and listen. And Dick begins in a friendly voice saying, Now look, fellas, why are you fighting us? Why? One of them speaks a little English, and he says, We are Hessians. Our duke has hired us out to the English king to fight terrible American rebels. You see? Dick says, well, Listen, you're being fooled. We're fighting for freedom. You can have it too. Desert, come with me to our general. You'll be given farms. At the prospect of a farm and peaceful living in a free land, Dick's captors become willing prisoners and follow him across the Delaware into Pennsylvania where Washington has set up an encampment. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, the American soldiers see a strange sight as Dick leads the squad of Hessian soldiers dressed in British clothes into their camp. And last picture, Dick is reporting to General Washington himself, saying, Sir, I promised the prisoners to be given farms. They told me that a large body of Hessians is holding Trenton, and they don't think you'll dare, now that it's winter, to recross the Delaware and attack them. Washington smiles. <laughs> to get those soldiers to join the Americans? It certainly was. Who were the Hessians? Well, the Hessians was another name for German soldiers. And they were soldiers who would hire out for wars for pay. Another name for them was mercenaries, soldiers who would fight on either side for money. Oh, I see. And the English hired these soldiers? Yes, lots of them. Oh, but I hope that they're all going to join George Washington. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now, here's Rusty Riley, right underneath Dick's Adventures. Oh, and this I've been wanting to read because Rusty had followed Squire Boggs and Captain Clune out by the harbor where Squire Boggs was using the black light like the smugglers did. That's right, and then Flip, Rusty's dog, started to bark. Yes, and Squire Boggs heard the dog, and now I'm afraid that he's apt to find out that Rusty has been spying on him. So quick, let's read. Let's find out. All right, here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Squire Boggs hears Flip bark. He says to Captain Clune, You row the boat in under the pier, Clune. There's somebody snooping around. I'll have a look. Rusty, who's hiding behind a rock, overhears Squire Boggs and says to himself, Oh, golly, Squire Boggs must have heard Flip. Oh, he's coming back. Maybe if we hide behind this rock, he won't see us. Quickly, Rusty and Flip hide. Squire Boggs moves along the shore, investigating. He doesn't see anything, so he finally says... Hmm. Yeah, guess I must be getting jittery. There doesn't seem to be anybody around here. Just then, last picture of the row, Flip barks again, and Squire Bog says, huh. Well, now, I guess I wasn't so wrong after all. Behind that rock, huh? And a moment later, first picture, bottom row, Squire Boggs comes toward the sound of Flip's bark and discovers Rusty. 
Squire Boggs exclaims. Oh, so it's you, eh? Well, now, what are you hiding for? Come out, boy. It's only old Squire Boggs. Rusty says. Well, what do you want? Well, Captain Clune and I are engaged in uh, <coughs> a peculiar kind of uh, night fishing. Come along, boy. I'll show you. Night fishing? Oh, I see. Well, sure, I'd like to watch, but, but, but I ought to go home. Tex told me to go to bed. Squire Boggs replies. Oh, fiddlesticks, boy. He wouldn't mind your being with me. Come along. We're fishing from that old schooner hulk. And Squire Boggs takes Rusty and Flip aboard the old schooner hulk and tells them to go below. Last picture, Captain Clune joins Squire Boggs on deck. Squire Boggs whispers... It's that kid, Rusty. I told him to go below and wait. Help me slide the hatch cover on. Then we can keep him safe until we stow the stuff. Captain Clune replies. Aye, aye, Squire. That was real quick thinking. You mean that they've got Rusty and Flip locked up down below in that old ship? That's exactly what they've done. Well, what are they going to do to them? They're going to try to finish up their dirty work so that Rusty won't see it. Yes, but what if Rusty does find out what's going on? What's going to happen then? They might hurt Rusty. Well, that's something that'll have to wait until next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Greasy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>